We talk about pay inequity. Women often have to do 20 to 25% more work and do it better than their male counterparts in order to earn an equivalent salary. There's a problem with that, and we need to start calling them out. Welcome to The Bid, where we break down what's happening in the markets and explore the forces changing the economy and finance. I'm your host, Samara Cohen, Chief Investment Officer of ETF and Index Investments. As we embark upon Women's History Month, The Bid welcomes four senior female leaders of BlackRock and their guests for four special crossover episodes in partnership with my own LinkedIn video series, In Progress. On my series in progress, I speak with inspiring female leaders from the world of finance and beyond about their personal and professional journeys and how that ties back to what they define as their purpose. I'm excited to kick off this four-episode mini-series as I invite my BlackRock colleagues to have their own conversations about progress and purpose. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Annie McKee best-selling author, respected academic, speaker, and sought-after advisor to top global leaders. Her latest book, How to Be Happy at Work, The Power of Purpose, Hope, and Friendships, became a bestseller during the pandemic. Annie has advised many of the world's most influential leaders, from companies such as Thomson Reuters, Sanofi, the United Nations Development Program, Unilever, and Luxottica, to name just a few. Whether she's giving talks to business leaders, teaching doctoral students, or working in provincial government offices in South Africa, Annie is committed to helping good leaders become better and to creating vibrant workplace cultures where people and their institutions can thrive. Annie, welcome to the bed. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. I am so excited for our conversation because I'm a big fan of your work. But first, I'd love to hear a little bit about your story. Who are you and how'd you get here? Well, thank you for asking. I guess I didn't follow a typical path. But then again, what's a typical path? I grew up as a very poor kid and that carried on into adulthood. I did all kinds of things to keep my family going. And then I realized if I want to have impact the way I want to have impact on people and the world, then I got to do something different because it's really hard to do it from here. I finally went to college in my late 20s and graduate school and started working with businesses and found I felt really good about being able to impact individuals and companies and hopefully our nation and our world by helping people become better leaders. And I couldn't have done that from where I started, so I had to find my own way. But really, everybody's got a story, right? Samara, you have a story. Yours is not like anybody else's. I know you face challenges too. And one of the things I think is really important is to remember when we encounter somebody in the workplace, we may not know their story. We may never know their story, but they've got one. And we need to be aware of that when we're interacting with them. And I think it helps us be more human, be more helpful, and be more respectful, too. I love that. And thank you so much, because I thought I knew a lot about you based on your work, but I didn't know that part of your story. And now you are a coach, an educator, a writer, a speaker, an advisor, what is the most exciting part of your work? First of all, I absolutely love my work and I feel really fortunate. Not everybody does. Underneath all of the hassle and the problems at work, a lot of us really love what we do, but I really love my work. I love the world of ideas and trying to figure out some answers to the big problems that we face in our world, in our businesses. And we are facing big problems. Let's face it. We really, truly are. It's a cliche, but we're in an era of change that is unlike any other. Facing geopolitical issues, facing market issues, facing changes in the way we live our lives. And what's most precious to me about my work is that I have the privilege of actually thinking about these problems and then finding ways to reach people to understand how they experience their issues, their problems, their joys, their challenges at work, and then help them, help them leverage the joys and the strengths and the talents that they bring to the workplace and their lives, and also help navigate some of these challenges. So you wrote an amazing book called How to Be Happy at Work, and you wrote it in 2015, and I actually didn't read it myself until 2022, and the book really exploded over 
the pandemic. What were the key messages and why did they resonate so much in 2020? So interesting. I did write that book prior to the pandemic. And the reason I wrote that book is because I'm actually not a happiness scholar. I'm a leadership person. I work with leaders and help them be better leaders. And I started getting really frustrated because we know a lot about leadership. We know that emotional intelligence makes a difference. We know we need to be self-aware and be empathetic and to understand our people and motivate them. We know all this stuff. And yet, I didn't see the needle changing fast enough in our companies. And I'm talking companies of all sorts all over the world, from retail to energy to media, you name it. I work in a variety of industries and sectors. So I could see that despite how much we know about leadership, and culture, and all that goes into that, we weren't moving the needle fast enough. So I went back and looked at a number of studies that I had done, not academic studies, practical studies that we had done in business to try to help them understand what's working and what's not in terms of their leadership, their management practices, and their culture. I looked at all these interviews, and I found that people were crying out for something. Employees at all levels were saying things like, I want to love my job. I loved my company when I started, and I'm not sure I do anymore. Something's wrong. And I looked really deeply into that, and what they were asking for was happiness at work. And I thought, what can I contribute to this? So I started doing some more research of my own, reading some of the positive psychologists, and I found that Indeed, there are a few things people really need in order to feel engaged and happy at work and to be really good at what they do. One of them, I think you'll be familiar with this, Samara, is a sense of purpose, a sense that our work is meaningful, and that we have impact on people and on our company and on our communities, our customers and our clients. Another is a sense of hope, and not just hope that our company's going to do well, but hope that we're going to do well that we're going to realize our dreams, whatever those might be, that we have a path to a future that is meaningful to us. And that may be different. Yours might be different than mine, Samara, but we need to feel that in our workplaces, we're supported on that path. And the final thing, I laugh because when I went to my publisher and said, you know what people really want at work is friendships. And they said, oh, you can't really talk about friendships in the workplace. You can't have the hard conversations with friends. And I said, on the contrary, if we're going to have hard conversations with people, we need respect. We need trust. We need to know each other a little bit. We need to share some values. We need to like each other. That is a definition of workplace friendship that may be different than in our personal lives, but it's critically important for us to feel that we are in it together and that we're trying to accomplish something that will better us all. You're right. When you and I first met, we really connected over the importance of purpose and a sense of purpose in one's career and at work. And I think for me, it was those other two things that were newer to think about, but particularly resonated right now, especially coming off such a difficult and challenging markets environment as 22, that sense of hope and optimism and the sense of friendship. So I guess in the spirit of Women's History Month, are there aspects of being happy at work now that you think are particularly challenging for women? We learned a lot during the pandemic about women and work and about our experience at work. Or I should say, a lot became exposed because as women, we already knew it. Despite it being now 2023, we are still doing the bulk of the work in the home. We're doing the bulk of the work in our communities, and we are working harder than our male counterparts for the same or less pay. And women started to become really fed up with that. In many cases, they had no choice. They could not go to back to work because there was no childcare. But even coming out of that, women that I know and that I coach and that I'm talking with at the executive ranks are saying, I'm not sure I want to do that anymore. I'm not sure I want to give that much of myself to this entity, to this job, which, by the way, I love and I'm really good at, until the conditions change a little bit. Women are standing up and saying, all right, we've been talking about this for 50 years at least. It's time for change. 
I think that's one thing we really have to pay attention to. For women, it's harder to find that hopeful path to the future. There are more barriers in our way. There just are, and we need to start calling them out. One of the things that I've noticed is that we talk about pay inequity. It's not always the dollar amount. It's the workload. Women often have to do 20 to 25 percent more work and do it better than their male counterparts in order to earn an equivalent salary. There's a problem with that. There really is. And we need to be calling it out. We also need to recognize that our male counterparts, it's not their fault. They've not been telling our institutions to pay them more or make them work less. They want these changes as much as we do. They do. We all do. So what can we do about that? We can recognize that some of these things have gotten to the point where it's time we take a stand and make a change. That'll take a lot of courage, a lot of courage, because it means changing systems that have been in place for a long time. It won't happen overnight. But we can indeed make these changes if we all say it out loud and not sweep it back under the rug where it was pre-2020 pandemic experience. Can you give me an example of some of the changes today you find yourself advocating for or encouraging leaders who you work with to consider or look at? Yeah, and this is relevant for both men and women. One of the things that people have been saying coming out of this era, people have been looking at their lives and their work, and they've been asking the question, how do I want to spend my time? How do I want to engage with my work? How do I want to engage with my family, my loved ones, my friends, my personal life, whatever it might be? And they have found that the rules that have been in place for many years aren't really supportive of making the kinds of choices that a lot of people want to make. So when I'm working with executives, I'm talking with them about how will we engage our employees? How will we make sure people feel really excited and motivated and wanting to give that extra effort? It's not about counting the hours that they're in the workplace. It's looking at what do they need? How can I support them? What kind of lifestyle arrangements are we willing to make in this company to support people, not just women, Men, too, people who identify in a lot of different ways, are going to want to speak up. They are speaking up and they're voting with their feet. We are still in the era of the Great Resignation. Tragically, there are layoffs happening, partly because of the gigantic expansion that happened during the pandemic in certain industries. And that is really hard for people and for the companies who are engaging in this. But we still need to hold on to our very best. And they're voting with their feet if we're not able to look at what they want and a sense of meaning. They want to know they're having impact. They want to feel that the future is hopeful. And you're right, Samara, it is hard in this market environment, especially in this industry. It is very hard. And yet, I think most of us, when we dig deep, recognize that if this is one of those major turning points in our economic world, then we do have to be at our very best to not only keep up with it, but to get ahead of it and to see where we go in the future. I agree. I think we have the opportunity to tell a tremendous story of resilience and of progress. And progress, in fact, is the theme of a lot of these conversations, what it means to be in progress, to always be a work in progress. What does that mean for you? What are you focused on progressing or improving the most in your work? One of the things I truly believe is that now is not a time to pretend we know all the answers, not in the midst of this kind of change. And anybody who is pretending is either trying to put on that game face for folks at work or at home, or they're sticking their head in the sand. So I honestly think that all of us need to be looking at how we lead, how we manage, how we remain resilient. Maybe those things that we did in the past aren't going to work. For me, it's related to that. How do I stay resilient in the midst of all this change? How do I ensure that I don't stumble or fall flat on my face because I'm exhausted and burned out? It happens to me. It happens to a lot of people. And we're in what I think is another pandemic related to stress and mental health issues that are a result of all the changes we've been talking about, the market conditions, 
this pandemic era, but also related to people's going 24-7 way before the pandemic. Burnout is a real thing. So we need to learn how to use our emotional intelligence to stave off burnout. How do we use our self-awareness and emotional self-control to see burnout when it's heading for us or when we're heading for it and stop it before it happens? I really like what you said about just acknowledging that we don't have all the answers. Sometimes I think it's like the ultimate power move to be in a meeting and say, I don't know. Let's talk about how we find out. But I'd love your thoughts since, again, your audience is leaders around the world. How do you balance the need to inspire confidence, show strength, and be strong for your peers and your teams with that vulnerability and authenticity? How do you make those things live together? I think there's a difference between decisiveness and a belief that we know all the answers. We can not know all the answers and still be ready to make a decision and to bring our people along with us. I think those are two very different things. The best leaders are decisive and they do inspire confidence, but to get there, they open themselves up to as much information as possible. They don't stick their head in the sands. They're not susceptible to what I call CEO disease. You've probably heard that term. It came out a long time ago, but it's very real. The higher you go in an organization, the less people are willing to tell you, especially about yourself. So we need to create a culture around us where people will tell us the truth. And with the truth, we can enter into uncertainty and make decisions with as much information as we can possibly get. There's so many things that I could ask you. I wish that we had hours to talk, but going back to your own story, which again, thank you for sharing with me. If you could go back and have a conversation with yourself in one of your early days at figuring out how do you want to make money and how do you want to work, what's the one piece of advice you would have given yourself? Trust yourself. I looked like I trusted myself because I was very bold. But underneath all that, I was pretty scared. And as it turned out, I didn't need to be as scared as I was. So for all of those listeners who are thinking, what's my next move? And I'm kind of scared to take it. Trust yourself. You are where you are for a reason. And your next step is probably going to be easier than you think it will be. Well, in the spirit of Women's History Month, I think trust yourself is an awesome mantra Thank you so much, Annie. It's been really fun talking to you today. Thank you, Samara. You too. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Bid. On our next episode, Nermity Shah invites Alex Carter, clinical professor of law at Columbia Law School, to discuss finding her purpose in mediation and teaching. Make sure you subscribe to The Bid wherever you get your podcasts. This material is intended for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice, a recommendation or an offer or solicitation to purchase or sell any securities, funds or strategies to any person in any jurisdiction in which an offer, solicitation, purchase or sale would be unlawful under the securities laws of such jurisdiction. The opinions expressed are as of the date of publication and are subject to change without notice. Reliance upon information in this material is at the sole discretion of the listener. Investing involves risks. BlackRock does and may seek to do business with companies covered in this podcast. As a result, listeners should be aware that the firm may have a conflict of interest that could affect the objectivity of this podcast. For more information, visit blackrock.com forward slash the bid.